a political touchstone is what you made my identity. And you're talking about science being a political thing? Science is not a political thing. My existence, my existence as a trans woman is a hot topic in politics. It makes no sense to me. It's ridiculous. Gender dysphoria is no joke, people. It hurts. It hurts a lot. It hurts physically and mentally. Would, would you give up your testicles for your medical treatment? I did. That's how important this is to me. Why are you wanting to stop that treatment for anyone? Why do you care? I did. I do. I need medical treatments for my gender dysphoria. I would give my left nut for estradiol. In fact, I will give both of my testicles for estradiol. How's that? That's how much I'm willing to pay. How much are you willing to pay for your medical treatment? Hello, hello, and thank you for joining me. It's Brandy's World, and I'm Brandy Beckett. Today, we are continuing our look at the podcast Generation Indoctrination, colon, The Transgender Battle, which is a podcast that is brought to us by The Christian Post and hosted by Brandon Showalter. Episode two is taking longer than expected, so we're going to do another attempt at finishing episode two of season two for Generation Indoctrination. So let's hear what else they have to tell us. So do these experimental medical measures actually prevent a trans identifying person from taking their own life? And perhaps the most famous study that followed the post-operative transsexual identified persons in Sweden over the course of 30 years, researchers found that even in famously liberal Scandinavian nation of Sweden, the rate of completed suicide was 19 times higher after so-called transition when measured against population match control groups. How much higher is it before, Brandon? You don't want to mention that statistic. I believe it's somewhere at 40 to 44 percent higher than the other cohorts, people not getting treatments for that. Suicide rates in among the transgender community is ridiculously high. And yes, even in very liberal places, if they are ignorant to the social issue that you're talking about, there can be people treated very poorly in even socially liberal places. It's not a political thing to be a human and to recognize other humans' identities. So yeah, people can be dicks and people can socially oppress people to to induce such things as, as death by suicide. And it is very high in our community. And manipulating those results to say that, whoa, it's scary that 19% is, is at risk more, 19% more than just the general population is at risk, even though we treat them. That sounds awful. But what sounds much better is to say, before we treat this community, 44% of them are at risk of death by suicide. And after treatment, we drop that number from 44 down to 19. That treatment is working. We need more of that treatment to get that number even lower because it works. Quit manipulating the, these statistics here. Anyone can play a statistic manipulation game to make their whatever pet little project look good. You think you're very clever at this, Brandon, but you're not that clever at it. It's plain that you're just cherry picking out these little statistics to drop them here and scare people. When that's not a scary statistic, that's a hopeful statistic. We got it down from 44 to 19 after treatment. That is good. My goodness. In other words, over the long term, the exact opposite of what gender activists say was found to be true. Gender activists routinely claim that being transgender increases the risk of suicide by 48%. If true, this is alarming and warrants our attention. But from where did this statistic come? Apparently, 
2,078 questionnaires were distributed by the LGBTQ community in the UK, of which 27 respondents claimed to be transgender persons under the age of 26. 13 claimed to have had attempted suicide in the past. The questionnaire was non-randomized. Anyone who wanted to fill it out could do so or refuse to do so. No information is known about the 13 young people who said they had attempted suicide, including whether their attempt was before, after, or despite treatment, or even whether they had received treatment at all. I like how he's so critical on, on this survey to, to see where that was pulled out. I'm not even familiar with that one at 48%. The, the studies I've read was somewhere between 40 and 44, but 48, yeah, well, I was looking at American studies, so. I mean, you can, you can compare. Maybe they did bad studies. They did a bad job of getting the research. They were still kind of in the ballpark from other more rigorous uh, studies that come up with that in, across the line. Every time they do a statistical study on transgender people, it's somewhere over 40% of people untreated who are at risk of death or suicide. It is very high. They cannot deny that. And, and to say that treatment is not working is just not being honest. And that's not cool. Despite the non-academic nature of the study, the inability... Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. They, they critique this study very well. But earlier episodes, they'll bring up some survey studies that they have, like one that they got from literally Myers Church his ministry the other guy's ministry they pulled his church to get a poll that they brag about on this how much people hate trans people and don't accept transgender people it was his church that he preaches to that they got the statistics from and now they want to critique this this study from UK. Well, if you don't like the study from UK, get some of the studies from the US. Why aren't you using the studies from the US anyway? Because you live in the US. All of y'all live in the US, but you want to cherry pick some studies that you can pick apart. Integrity, integrity, Brandon, integrity. Show a little more of it, please to verify or replicate the results and the fact that nothing about the study shows the effects of any treatment protocol it is truly astounding that gender ideology activists have given it so much weight when told that his data had been misrepresented by gender ideology activists in this way the researcher replied that it was unfortunate that his quote research is used by non-scientists in the context of their own agendas unquote in 2022, a study done by the researchers at the University of Washington was heralded in the media as absolute proof that transgender medical treatment reduces depression and suicidality by 60%. The immense media coverage treated the study's results as a major medical breakthrough. Don Ennis, now listed as a former columnist, wrote in Forbes that this research, quote, provides a strong rebuttal to anti-transgender activists and Republican lawmakers across the country who have tried to ban gender-affirming health care for trans and non-binary youth, unquote. Good quote. Similar comments flooded the internet, creating an almost gleeful, I told you so, retort to those who have questioned the efficacy of such treatment. Since that time, investigative reporters have examined this study in which about 100 young people ages 13 to 20 filled out a 16-question survey reporting their feelings of depression and anxiety, with one question asking about thoughts of self-harm. The participants had all consulted with a gender transition clinic and were given the questionnaire four times over the course of 12 months. The study's weaknesses are quite glaring. There was no double-blind aspect to it, which is standard for legitimate medical research. The statistical methods used were rudimentary and flawed. No comparison was made between- It's a self-identifying self survey that people put out. Because what are you going to do? Um, get everyone's medical record and go in or set up a clinic and just have all the trans people come in and, and examine them? No. They asked these survey questions. I've participated in a couple of those surveys myself. They ask you questions about treatments you've had and your life experiences. The participants who received medical therapy and those who received psychotherapy. No assessment was made as to whether the participants' alarming mental health struggles were caused by gender dysphoria or whether gender dysphoria was one manifestation among many of their unstable mental health situation. 
No comparison was made with those reporting similar levels of depression, anxiety, and suicidality, but who did not identify as transgender. Factors were not adequately accounted for. No assessment of childhood trauma or its treatment was reported, even though childhood trauma is strongly correlated with gender dysphoria. Since only a tiny fraction of respondents were in the treatment group at the beginning, and only a tiny fraction of respondents remained in the no treatment group at the end, it is almost impossible to get an accurate picture of what happened during the 12 months. You are so good at pulling this report apart. You are, you are analyzing and you're critiquing and ripping apart this study. Why don't you do that for the other studies that you brought up? I'm Brandon. Is it because you have a, a harsh bias that you just want to, to shine up your conclusion? Because you seem to be picking this apart pretty good, but it still kind of stands that suicide rates are way higher in trans. How are you trying to argue against that? However bad these studies are, it doesn't erase that fact. It, I don't know why you're trying to argue against high suicide rates in our community. So what does this vaunted study show? At best, it shows that those receiving puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones did not report improvement. Their self-reported levels of depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts remained about the same. They came into the study with serious mental health issues, and they completed the study with comparable levels of those same issues. If we look at the results in three and six months, which is when the researchers had more equal response rates, those who did not receive medical treatment reported larger drops in their depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts than those who did receive medical treatment. Did they need medical treatment? It was a large group and only a small portion were transgender people. The other people who weren't transgender people who didn't get gender dysphoria treatments, what they were okay because yes they're the control you're saying the control did better than than the test subjects i think that's what you're saying right you're saying the control did better those who didn't get the treatment that's what the study was predicted to show between the three and six month mark the charts accompanying the study show a worsening of self-reported thoughts of suicide for those receiving medical treatment and a lessening of self-reported thoughts of suicide for those who did not receive medical treatment. The researchers have thus far refused to release the raw data, so there is no way to understand what actually happened or to replicate the results. At the very least, this is hardly the breakthrough the University of Washington Public Relations Department heralded or that was breathlessly reported in the media. Please understand, we take mental health struggles seriously. We work with young people facing these issues. We feel deep compassion for them and want them to get better. When it comes to minors with mental health struggles, we have found that helping them feel seen and cared for is a major part of the healing process. Care and concern help foster a belief that they will get better, and this belief is very powerful. People in the field of psychology call it resilience. A review of 50 studies examining treatment-resistant depression showed that patients given placebos report improvement of 35% to 40% in their symptoms. Their belief that treatment is making a difference seems to be what is making the difference at least a third of the time. We know we are down in the weeds here, but let us apply that understanding to the vaunted University of Washington Transgender Medicine study. One would expect to see a 35% to 40% improvement just by children having someone in authority pay attention to their problem, even in the absence of medical treatment. None of this was examined in the University of Washington study. This, plus criticisms such as the ones we briefly discussed above that have gone unanswered by the researchers, led the University of Washington spokesperson to admit that reports about the study's breakthrough nature included, quote, some pretty concerning claims, unquote and announced that the epidemiology department would stop, quote, driving traffic to this piece, unquote. Okay, you've pulled up a few studies that you don't agree with and you don't like. You didn't make a point though. You, this, the point still stands that the trans community without treatment is very, very high suicide rate. After treatment, they still go down. Anecdotally and statistically, they go away because you're treating some of those harsh, harsh symptoms of what you experience, that gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is no joke, people. It hurts. It hurts a lot. It hurts physically and mentally. 
So, well, some of you may be asking, well, what is gender dysphoria? Gender dysphoria is a misalignment with your gender identity and your gender expression. When those are not aligned, it causes lots of distress and lots of hurt and pain. Aligning your identity with your expression and your performance is how we treat gender dysphoria. And the main way is social, social affirmation. That is the main thing that we treat gender dysphoria with, especially with children. Medical treatments, also really good for individuals who need the medical treatments. Not everyone needs medical treatments for gender dysphoria. I did, I do. I need medical treatments for my gender dysphoria. Why are you wanting to stop that treatment for anyone? Why do you care? Right now you're probably wondering, how is it possible that such minuscule studies with such ambivalent results could drive such a huge nationwide agenda? This is an example of the politicization of science, a subject we will discuss in a later chapter of this book. What about the politicization of my identity? Y'all made my identity a political platform and a political hot stone. A political touchstone is what you made my identity. And you're talking about science being a political thing? Science is not a political thing. Neither should my gender identity be anything political. But for some reason in the second decade of the 21st century here in the United States and many other places, my identity, the identity, my existence, my existence as a trans woman is a hot topic in politics. It makes no sense to me. It's ridiculous. And you want to talk about science being in politics? I don't even know what you're talking about, science being political. It's not. Neither should my existence. Yet such politicization is well hidden. If you did an internet search for the University of Washington study, none of its problems would become evident unless you looked several pages deep into the search results and knew specifically what you were looking for. The truth is very hard to find. The political motive is not the only one driving gender ideology. Observers with common sense have noted that one does not cut nor sterilize the body to heal the mind. And yet doctors continue to guide patients they diagnose as gender dysphoric down the path of experimental medicalization. It is a business move that is as cynical as it is lucrative. As previously noted, when children are put on hormone blockers, it is likely they will receive pediatric Lupron. Investigative journalist Jennifer Billick noted in a speech in July of 2022 at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center in Washington, D.C. that the adult version of Lupron is quite lucrative. It costs $4,800 to treat endometriosis in women for a three-month dose, according to a 2018 investigative report. The pediatric version is even more lucrative, $9,700 for the same dose. A subcutaneous implant to deliver this drug to children is $35,000. A similar implant for adult men battling prostate cancer costs $4,400. Using these numbers, if just 100 children out of the 42,000 U.S. children diagnosed last year with gender dysphoria took these drugs for seven years, it would amount to $27 million in drug sales. And that is only the blockers. Cross-sex hormones are another moneymaker for the medical industry. You know what, Brandon? I think I might be with you on this argument. I, you're arguing for universal health care, right? That's what you want. We shouldn't have to be paying these ridiculous prices for medical treatments. I agree. You know how much it costs to treat a child who has a, a broken leg or a child who has cancer or a child who has gender dysphoria or a child who has um, bloodborne diseases or a child that has genetic diseases or a child that has anything. Medical stuff's expensive, yes, no argument. No argument, medical sucks. Our medical system in the United States sucks because it's not universal. Agreed. Let's fight for universal health care, Brandon. Let's do it. And those who begin this experimental medicalization will be on it for as long as they wish the condition to persist, quite possibly for life. Think about that. By encouraging puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, Big Pharma and Big Medicine could foster long-term and extremely bankable dependence on their products. Just 
just like the cigarette company did. <laughs> According to Global Market Insights, the national profit for these kinds of operations was $623 million in 2022, having doubled in just three years. By 2032, the value projection for this industry is listed at $1.9 billion. They got us. They, they trapped me into getting a, be a lifelong patient of this medicine. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, you got me. I'm going to be on estradiol the rest of my life. I'm hooked on that drug. <laughs> I think it's so worth taking estradiol to help my body become more attuned to my identity you know how much I'm willing to pay for estradol I would give my left nut for estradol in fact I will give both of my testicles for estradol how's that that's how much I'm willing to pay how much are you willing to pay for your medical treatment would, would you give up your testicles for your medical treatment I did that's how important this is to me. Ask yourself that question. Would you? I would do it again. But you're not understanding that this medicine's important to people. Hormone replacement therapy is very important to people. And yes, people will be on it their entire lives because they're dealing with the gender dysphoria that's going to haunt them the rest of their lives unless you treat it. So yes, treatment, the whole life. I don't have a problem with that. Why should you? We see this as a predatory industry which represents crony capitalism at its worst. And remember that if a child can be medicalized in this way, he or she will be a patient for life. These brutal surgeries often require extensive follow-up care, which of course means additional fat profits for these industries. Detransitioning is the process of a person psychologically reintegrating with the biological sex with their self-perception of gender identity. To do this, a person must unwind layers of deceitful cultural and medical programming. Detransitioners often have a moment or series of moments where they realize that attempts to overwrite nature are futile and cannot, by way of medical intervention, change their physiology to become the opposite sex. The coming challenge for the church, as we see it, is twofold. Equipping the next generation with the truth and philosophical tools to courageously engage this pervasive ideology and ministering to the wave of those medically harmed young people and their families whose lives have been shattered. Shattered is not too strong a word to describe what happens when people try to invert reality and end up being worse off than they were before. Abby Schreier, author of Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters, wrote about her experience engaging moms and dads who have dealt with adolescent and teenage daughters self-identifying as trans. Quote, Any of these parents would gladly pay a hundred bucks a gallon for unleaded gas to get their daughters to safety. A mom whose teen daughter is suddenly clamoring for top surgery would take her chances with COVID in a heartbeat. She'd sign up for an unmasked tour of the Wuhan Institute for Virology if she could only shield her children from the people who prefer to push gender ideology than do their actual jobs, much less respect the curtilage of a family." Unquote. Oh, that's a sad statement from a mother. And I'm sure there's parents that feel that way, that they, they're so scared and of this, of trans, of being trans, of the unknown, of the not, the, the, the normal, the social norm that they're supposed to be, of not this image they've had for their child. Your child is not a mold of an image you want to make them. If you, the, it makes me sad to think that this, this lady is saying these things. I would rather get COVID and die than see my child have top surgery. Do, uh, what kind of a life do you want? What kind of relationship do you want with your child? Do you want your child to have to not be them, to lie about who they are, to pretend to be something they're not around you, to you, with you, or just as themselves themselves? Don't you want your child to understand who they are? Do you want your child to express who they are? You would rather die then have your child express who they are because you don't think that they are is something worth being around. You really think that. You don't know your child if you really think that. 
When you, I'm sure you say you love your child, but do you love an image, an assignment of that child, or do you love that child? To say you'd rather die than have your child get gender dysphoria treatment is so hurtful. Wow. Wow, is what I have to say. I couldn't imagine my mother saying something like that. My goodness. Faithful Christians are going to have to exhibit a lot of patience in the coming years dealing with the fallout of the gender identity medical scandal. Of course, God can and does bring healing, sometimes quickly and suddenly. But as the number of detransitioners grows and more people realize that their decisions led them to permanently damage their bodies, compassionate followers of Jesus must be prepared to walk alongside. Practice of medicine has produced profound benefits for billions. Yet the idea that a medical technique that is possible is therefore ethical has led to widespread heartache. Francis Galton was one of the most respected scientists of his day. Yet his racist viewpoint led to the science of eugenics, which was practiced in the United States to forcibly sterilize 60,000 women. Antonio Igazmonis won a Nobel Prize for inventing the lobotomy and promoting it as a remarkable cure for mental illnesses like schizophrenia. 50,000 people received the procedure. Many died as a result, and the others had their lives ruined. The science seemed settled in both cases, but now we see them as colossal horrors. When the history is written, will gender-affirming care for people with gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria also be seen as a medical scandal? You, 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 had, you could have had some other examples then, too. You could have said, like, Sir Isaac Newton, he brought us the theory of gravity in classical physics. But he also spent more time writing about alchemy. So, so what, he was wrong about the other stuff? <laughs> yeah, not every scientist is going to hit a home run on everything. Science is an amazing process. Science is a self-correcting process. And that's what's beautiful about it. When the science is wrong, do you know how we correct the science? with more science. We do more science to correct the science. Science is a process and not everyone's going to always get a home run with it. But we've been doing gender dysphoria treatment for quite a while now and we're knocking it out of the park. Yes, so speculate all you want. Most scientists are going to be wrong about most things. That is just the way it is. The way science makes it right is we try to prove ourselves wrong. Like that's what a good scientist would do. A good scientist comes up with a hypothesis and they spend their energy and time trying to prove it wrong. And, and it is held up as right until it can be proven wrong. The theory of gravity has never been proven right. We just have not proven it wrong. It holds up. Every time we test classical gravity that Newton explained to us, it tests out exactly how it's supposed to. Every time we test gravity the way Einstein proposed it, it works. It tests out. Those things work. And Einstein gravity didn't replace Newton gravity is just a different way we look at gravity. It all explains the same phenomenon, but just in different lenses and different views. But it's science, and science corrects, and science produces other science. So yeah, science is going to be wrong. Just now to say that, that all of the treatment for gender dysphoria is going to be wrong is no, it's not going to be turned over at all. That's not going to be the case. No. Uh, no, because certain people are wrong about certain things doesn't mean that people are wrong about this. Gender dysphoria treatments work. We believe it will, but there is of a difference. You believe it will. Sterilization and lobotomization did not include built-in popular culture campaigns to get people to choose these procedures for themselves. This will take time to unwind. As more detransitioners like Stephen Richards come forward and detail the catastrophic, irreparable harm that was done to them, it will become impossible to ignore the carnage. Christians must not shrink back from the task of confronting the generational indoctrination that has occurred via the school system and throughout culture that has, most tragically, left many struggling people confused, disfigured, and sterilized. 
Thank you for listening. Oh, goodness. Okay. Oof. Oh, we, we got through that. Oh, this podcast is fun, isn't it, y'all? <laughs> oh, boy. This is great. Well, I am going to leave you as I always do with this message. Love yourself. But more importantly, like yourself and treat people the way they want to be treated. Bye-bye for now.